This is the story of STS-91. Discovery launched on June 2nd, and uh, we'll give you the highlights of the mission beginning with the launch, our walk out to the vehicle. We have a uh, beautiful day to go fly. You can see all the crews ready to go. And uh, we've got some pretty interesting scenes after we uh, drive to the pad, showing everybody getting in the vehicle with a camera that is located in the cockpit and gives you some unique perspective of what it's like to uh, climb aboard and get ready to launch. This drop-in happened about three and a half hours before liftoff, and uh, Charlie, of course, was the first one getting in. We've got some folks helping us uh, from the back of the uh, flight deck. Uh, Janet, of course, was, is here uh, getting dressed with some uh, suit techs, and uh, as everybody got in, it's about a 10 or 15 minute process per person uh, to get the parachute situated and, uh, and make sure you're comfortable because we are going to be laying there for, for quite a long time and, uh, and comfort was pretty important. You can see how strange it is to be climbing in uh, with the vehicle in the vertical and you have to end up on your back uh, in the proper launch configuration here. The camera's moved to the front uh, between Dom and I looking back, actually looking down uh, since the vehicle's in the vertical. Janet? Just before launch, they moved the walkway back, and six seconds prior to SRB ignition, we have the main engine's light. After everything is checked out and the engines are all go, the solid rocket boosters ignite, and we're off on our flight. This is a very interesting and emotional uh, aspect, or time for, for new flyers especially, because this is the first time we've experienced such emotions, such, um, such, such physical experiences, so this is very emotional. We had a camera that we uh, pointed out the overhead window, and it shows us uh, lifting off, and this is what would have been our view if we were to tilt our head backwards and look out at the uh, cape as it rotated underneath us during the uh, roll program. We also had a helicopter that was uh, in the area and it took a, a beautiful view of the shuttle coming up through the haze layer that uh, we don't see very often, and because of the gorgeous clear weather, we had this uh, really sparkling picture to uh, look back on the flight with. Got an incredible amount of thrust there, pushing us uh, skyward about uh, seven million pounds of thrust, a little bit less, and uh, booster separation about two minutes into the flight. Of course, there's a couple cameras on the shuttle that are looking at the SRBs as they uh, separate and of course they fall back to the water and are uh, pulled back in and, and reused like soda pop bottles um, for a later flight. Uh, right after uh, the SRBs leave us, uh, as we're passing through about Mach 13, the uh, orbiter rolls and we saw the horizon for the first time, which was really a, a great experience. Shortly after we're on orbit, it's important to be able to open the payload bay doors. This is critical for cooling of the orbiter during flight, we have uh, freon loops that are contained in the payload bay doors that allow us to radiate the heat outward. We can also see the space hab there in the back of the payload bay where we conducted several scientific experiments and where we um, held the equipment that we transferred to the Mir space station. Once we got on orbit, we opened the hatch that led from the mid deck to a tunnel led back to that space hab. So here I am opening that hatch that leads back to the space hab. In the hab we had several radiation experiments uh, and also a new communications experiment which you can see Franklin uh, holding here. The radiation experiments are on the rack uh, that I'm touching there on the side. Uh, we also had a lot of equipment that we were transferring to the mirror in that small volume. We had the alpha magnetic spectrometer which is a high energy particle physics experiment. Franklin was in charge of that experiment and he has his computers set up here and the main uh, purpose of this was to hopefully detect antimatter in space. Of course uh, one of our primary objectives was to uh, rendezvous and dock with the Mir space station and return Andy Thomas from uh, the final increment of Americans being on board the Mir space station as part of phase one. This is a view from the space station uh, of us approaching and then a, a reflective view from the shuttle 
as we uh, came in from underneath, ever so slowly closing on, on the mirror. You can see <coughs> the ring there in the lower left uh, near the center of the image is <coughs> the docking port of the mirror. And uh, we have a similar docking port in the shuttle payload bay, which uh, links the two vehicles. This is a target that we use in the final few feet for aligning the two uh, vehicles. We have a camera that views straight up the docking axis and allows us to make sure there's the contact uh, rebound a little bit there. And uh, we have a soft mate followed by some procedures that ret uh, retract uh, the mechanism into a hard mate. And once we've done some pressure checks, we can uh, then open the hatch and a pretty joyous moment begins here where we get to shake hands with our colleagues, friends that we haven't seen in several months. And, and of course, uh, it's uh, a great time for Andy and the Russians because they're welcome, welcoming us on board as you would any guest into your home. And uh, they haven't seen guests in a long time. And Andy's ready to come home. He's really happy. He's had a long, uh, arduous mission, very successful one at that. And it's just a great reunion of friends and uh, enjoying the success of a lot of uh, work in space, especially this crew that was there for so long. To go fly in space for the first time is, a, is an incredible experience, but to be able to go inside another space station, as we show here going through the uh, Crystal module, was, uh, was a wonderful experience for, for us. Uh, we're on our way now to a uh, press conference in the mirror base block, and we can see each person uh, coming down and uh, get, getting ready to go through the node into that base block module. You can see it's somewhat cramped in there. Uh, a lot of the equipment stowed along the walls, uh, making it passable for one or two people at a time. Franklin uh, grabbing at an M&M &M that was floating on by there. <laughs> This is the first chance we all got together on the Mir station in the base block. We uh, presented the Mir crew with some fresh vegetables, some fresh foods, and uh, some other tokens. And then we got down to the work of transferring all the thousands of pounds of materials that we had to take from the shuttle. Uh, Wendy Lawrence was in charge of this transfer process, which is a very large job. It had, uh, as I said, thousands of pounds of material that had to be transferred from the shuttle and then back from the mirror to the shuttle. And everything had a place. And um, it was a, a very difficult process, making sure we didn't have everything backed up and, and a very small volume so that we were able to continue the transfer process. Packing away materials is also a very challenging thing to do in zero gravity. But she did a great job in, in getting all that organized. It seemed like we had just gotten to the mirror when it was time to say goodbye, and uh, we had some gifts from the uh, the mirror crew to us, and and some to them, of course. We had some uh, documents that have the, the signatures from all the astronauts and cosmonauts that have been involved with the Phase One program that we uh, that we signed, and then uh, you can see the hesitation by the by the mirror crew to uh, finally close the hatch. They wanted us to stay at seam, and and uh, we're we're uh, feeling some. Uh, sadness to, to close that hatch for the last time and say goodbye to Andy. Yeah, the last uh, docking mission for the shuttle with the mirror, somewhat nostalgic uh, now looking back on it, that uh, what was a very, very successful program uh, is completed and uh, we'll be leaping off into the new International Space Station. Uh, it uh, was a tremendous leap forward for all of us to be able to take uh, working with the Russians from scratch and learning how to do these complex missions. As the pilot, I was extremely fortunate to be able to fly the, uh, the shuttle during the undocking and the subsequent fly-around maneuver. Uh, as you could see from the, the previous shots, everyone was crowded into the flight deck, and uh, it was almost like trying to drive a car with six or seven people in the front seat. Um, but uh, we moved away very slowly at only a, about uh, two-tenths of a foot per second, and we went out to a distance of about 200 feet and started a fly-around. Once we uh, got to uh, a station keeping position, we had the, the Mir crew pressurize this specter module with a gas that was supposed to be fluorescent against the darkness of space. And with that, we would determine where this 
leak was coming from. As it turns out, that, uh, that fluorescence was not visible to us, but it provided a, a great uh, exercise in, in maneuvering around the, uh, the mirror and, and maybe uh, refining some techniques we might use further on with the International Station. Also during this fly around, it gave us some beautiful views of the mirror and the moon and, and uh, the Earth all together, which, uh, which was very unique. Another thing that we did during our flight was to check out the improved arm, robotic arm on the shuttle. This arm has been improved to handle the larger masses that will be uh, used for the International Space Station modules. We had the opportunity to undock the, the arm or unberth the arm during the time we were docked with Mir and also to take the arm over to the starboard side and look at a port that was leaking some water. We were aware of this problem prior to launch, so during the mission we wanted to take the end effector camera, the camera on the end of the robotic arm, and take it over and look at this port that we knew was leaking to ensure that no large icicle was growing out the side of this um, port, which could be a danger on the reentry if it broke off and hit part of the shuttle. Fortunately, there was no icicle seen just the small ice crystals that you can see at the top of the screen there. So we, uh, we were able to stow the arm and we're not forced to have to try to knock an icicle off with the end effector. But this is a, a great exercise and a, a great tryout of this new robotic arm. Of course, every uh, sunrise and sunset is beautiful and since they happen every 45 minutes, one or the other, it's, uh, it's great to, to see that for uh, for us here on Earth. Looking at the Earth is one of our favorite pastimes. None of us can get enough of this, of course, and uh, it's great to be trying to uh, locate favorite places on the Earth, and each of us, uh, where we come from, is among those favorites. This is coming up on Cape Cod, and the shuttle uh, right at the very bottom of the screen is looking about where my hometown is, and uh, we're flying from southwest to northeast, Cape Cod is approaching the center of the screen there now. And uh, this is real-time movement of the orbiter over the Earth. It gives you an idea of how fast it goes by. This is uh, up into Canada, uh, Nova Scotia. And uh, some very rare views of that part of the Earth, because normally there's a lot of cloud cover there. Some uh, views of life on board, uh, just to give you an idea of uh, the way we get through our daily activities. Uh, sharing some meals together here. Uh, this is a galley area and uh, we prepare our meals and uh, share them and it's one of the few times when we can sit quietly and think about the day's activities and exercise also being very important for daily activities. We also did some sort of fun experiments while we were on board. Having a physicist here, we were doing some fluid dynamics experiments studying water water tension, uh, surface tension, and so it's a, it's sort of a little time that we had to study things like this, some uh, fluid mixing here shown uh, with some orange juice and some water coming into contact. Andy had some experiments that he did on Mir which he transferred to the shuttle. This was a, an experiment dealing with cancer cells that he's growing to help better study the formation and the growth of cancer tumors so that hopefully we can develop a medication that will stop the growth of these tumors. We also had a uh, combustion experiment and Charlie's got the fire extinguisher there ready to put it out if, it, if I get out of control with it. But we had a couple of acrylic samples that, uh, that we burned to study the, uh, the burn characteristics in zero G and you can see that uh, it's, it's a great, uh, great deal different than on Earth where a flame would appear as sort of a teardrop shape because of the uh, convection due to gravity. And here it burns in more of a 360 degree uh, sphere and we get some very interesting burn patterns that, uh, that are being studied on Earth, both for uh, uh, trying to determine how to work with uh, flames on orbit. The uh, day before re-entry, uh, we're doing some checkouts of the shuttle systems for landing, making sure everything is uh, go. And uh, then you see the uh, the orbiter on entry at the, in this scene uh, from cameras at the Kennedy Space Center. And here you have the, uh, the view that 
Dom and I have through the front window with some instrumentation displayed on a what we call a head-up display. Uh, you have airspeed and altitude information, some glide path information, basic navigation to find the, the proper approach to the runway. The runway is there at the top center with the, the long line um, uh, under the display and we will uh, continue to line ourselves up as we get down to about 300 feet, Dom lowers the landing gear and I continue to uh, bring us in over the approach end of the runway. This is a good view from inside here. And uh, we come across the threshold at about 230 knots and uh, aim for a touchdown spot a couple of thousand feet down at 200 knots and, uh, and then I begin to lower the nose. This particular day we had a pretty good crosswind and it was a changing crosswind so we waited till the nose was on the ground before Dom deployed the drag chute and that's within the, uh, the pre-flight determined rules for the, the use of a drag chute. It, uh, in a crosswind, has a tendency to pull the nose um, off to uh, against the side that the wind's blowing from, and you uh, uh, want to be able to get the nose on the ground to maintain good positive control before you put that chute out. But in any event, uh, all of that worked as advertised for us, and Andy, of course, is on the mid-deck uh, wondering why it seems like 5G's is uh, on his body when we're all there back on Earth, and he is discovering what readaptation is all about. And he made some comment about how I should stop pulling a tight G turn here. But that's the story of STS 91, and we're happy to share it with you.